do you remember what cartridge it was? What caliber? I th- I want to say it was a 29 or 30. There was two cartridge sizes. There was sort of the small frame and the large frame. Mm-hmm. Ryan, you've got me on this one. I want to say it was oh, a tw- 29. stumped him. Yeah, <laughs> you stumped me. I'm Ryan Gresham. And this... This is Gun Talk Nation. This Gun Talk Nation is brought to you by Ruger, Aero Precision, Range Ready, SDS Imports, and Secure It. Hey, welcome into Gun Talk Nation. Today on the show, we're going to be going way back, way back in the way back machine. Uh, I say a lot, Mike, I say that there are a lot of different ways that people enjoy guns. Some people get into the tactical side of it. Some people like the competition side and accuracy. Some people like the mechanics of it. Like they love like, what is this a blowback action? Or is this gas impingement? You know, all this yeah. stuff, right? Another area is the historical side, um, which is admittedly, I know some stuff, but I'm not that deep. My knowledge is, is an inch deep and a half a mile wide on, sure. on historical stuff. Um, but you are, a historian, a gun historian, Smith and Wesson specifically, right? Yeah, I'm a firearms historian. I uh, did my history degree at North Carolina State University a couple of years ago. I wrote my thesis on the rise of Smith and Wesson as kind of an example of sort of an early modern enterprise in the 1850s, early 1860s, and that kind of got me into being a gun historian and then Crazy. specialized in Smith and Wesson after that. It seems like a lot of people kind of pick a path, like there's yeah. guys who specialize in Colt and specialize in even the Ruger Collector Association, even though it's not as old of a company. Um, why why Smith & Wesson? What interested you there? You know, Smith & Wesson was sort of at this interesting crossroads. Um, I, I think most people know that Colt, Colt came first with the revolver that was in the 1830s. And now we're actually learning that they probably weren't even the first. There was some other sort of early revolvers in the 1810s and 1820s. Um, but Smith & Wesson was at this really interesting crossroads because we had a modern distribution system in the country by the time Smith & Wesson came around. We had well-established railroads. We had well-established steamship lines. We had a well-established financial network. Mm-hmm. So all the conditions were really ripe for some company to really rise up. And of course, the development of cartridge ammunition. Yeah. That was really important. It, it actually came from France. It was Flaubert who originally developed that. But Smith & Wesson were the ones who looked at the cartridge and they looked at the revolver and said, hey, if we put these two together, we might have something. And the country wasn't quite a baby at that point. It was, start, like you said, getting yeah. some infrastructure going. Yeah, we were coming out of the sort of early Republic era. Um, so like I say, we had that distribution network. We had the financial network. Uh, there was well-established capitalists in New York and Boston that were very interested in funding these sorts of things. Interestingly, Smith & Wesson did actually self-fund the, the company that produced the revolver. But it, it was really interesting to see this company that, that started in 1856, in November of 1856, as this two-person okay. startup. And by 1860, they were so successful that they were actually able to build a purpose-built three-story factory in Springfield. That, even by modern standards, to do that in three years is incredible. That's some like tech. Uh, that's like what we hear about tech, right? Where yeah, you know they were they were nothing, and then now they're you know all over the place. It's a billion-dollar company or whatever, yeah, right? It's, it, it was just a remarkable rise, and to look at that and say, okay, wait a second. <laughs> To, to, to grow that much in three years, there had to be more going on than just a gun or just a cartridge mm-hmm. or something like that. Not, not that they weren't important, um, but Smith & Wesson was a really interesting example. And I, actually, I've started calling it kind of the, the 19th century Silicon Valley. This was mm-hmm. um, this yep. was a place where these fortunes could be made. So gun quickly. Valley, Connecticut, yeah. Massachusetts. So I always had the, the date 1852 mm-hmm. in my head for when Smith & Wesson started. They I think they had the 1852 club. Yep. Um, you said 1856. So talk about, (laughs) it's like, both things can be correct, I guess. And and actually there's a third date of 1854. So how did it all start? Yeah. So depending on what you read, you'll read a different date. So what we believe is that in 1852, there was a partnership that was, that was, we we think was the first partnership between Horace Smith and Daniel Baird Wesson. Okay. In 1854, they actually incorporated as a company called Smith & Wesson, and they were producing the Volcanic Magazine pistol at that point. 
that company, um, it, it kind of limped and struggled along. It was it, it was an interesting pistol, and it certainly set an, an important foundation for gun technology because, of course, that became the lever action. Um, but the company kind of struggled along a little bit. It was it was Smith and Wesson. Then, as it was faltering, some other investors came in, and it became the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. And eventually, that original 1854 Smith and Wesson became Winchester. There was okay. this shirt maker named Oliver, Win- Oliver Winchester <laughs> that invested in it, and he brought along this guy named Benjamin Tyler Henry, who who actually knew Smith and Wesson at that point. There, the, those relationships were already there. But that whole 1854 entity morphed into uh, the modern day Winchester company. Okay. It's a little bit like the original Ford Motor Company actually became Cadillac. Yeah. People don't know that. Yeah. So that was all going on in 1854 and 1855. In 1856, uh, Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson finally said, you know what, we're out. We want to do something different. And my theory is what happened was the Colt patent on the revolver was going to expire that year. And I think they were looking at that saying, hmm, everybody's going to come on the market with a revolver, but maybe we can do something even better than that. And we know that they knew about this this French invention from this guy named Flaubert of these little, uh, what we now call CB caps or 22 caps. Mm -hmm. So the idea of putting... Uh, the bullet and the powder and the primer into what was at that point a copper cartridge. And I think at some point, one of Horace Smith or Daniel Wesson sort of looked at the cartridge and looked at the revolver and said, hey, if we put those two together, we might have a winning formula here. So no one was was putting like metallic cartridges with guns at that point? Well, there were single shot guns. There, were, there was what we call sort of parlor guns, which mm-hmm. were just kind of single shot target shooting I guess you would call them pistols, um, but I don't know that anybody had taken um, the Flaubert cartridge and a revolver and said, "Let's put those two together." So, my research, uh, had, I believe that Smith and Wesson were the first to put those two together. They developed, of course, what was called, what became the Model One revolver, mm-hmm. and the company that they founded in 1856 in November of '56 is the Smith and Wesson that we know today. And they started by producing metallic cartridge revolvers, and they and they still make them to this day. Yeah. So that's where we get those three kind of competing dates from. So staying uh, that early, this is we're going to flash forward all the way to a new gun today, mm-hmm. uh, the 1854 yep. lever gun yep. that Smith and Wesson just released at this shot show. Mm-hmm. And some people know, some people don't. But we were saying, well, the reason they're calling it the 1854 is because Smith and Wesson actually and i'm gonna say it wrong but invented a lever gun then or yeah they brought out they had a design yeah you know the the word invention is a tricky one because (laughs) it it sort of implies that you know i don't know somebody wakes up in the middle of the night aha i have an idea right and you know the way iterations of ideas probably that's exactly it it's a very iterative process uh when we look at the history of the lever action we actually go back into the late uh, 1840s uh, there was a man whose last name was Hall who had some ideas about that. Uh, there was another man named Jennings who started to improvise on that. Uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry actually at, at some points in that did get involved. So it, it was really, I would say it's almost kind of like a ping pong game where you have an idea and you tell me and mm-hmm. then I sort of riff on that idea and I tell you and we, we kind of bounce it back and forth. So in 1854, we believe that that was the first time that a company had been incorporated uh, to try to mass produce and mass sell these lever action guns. There were there were some Hunt and Jennings uh, rifles that were sold. I, d- I don't know that there was ever a concerted effort to sort of mass produce those. I think we would probably still call those experimental guns at that mm-hmm. point. Um, but it is safe to say that uh, the, the lever action that we know today, Smith & Wesson, were very important. They had some key patents in that. Uh, and the volcanic, it, the, the volcanic magazine pistol itself wasn't that successful in 1854. That was probably more because of ammunition problems. They were using this sort of rocket ball. They called it rocket ball ammunition. Good name. <laughs> which which was really just a bullet that was hollowed out at the bottom. It had some powder and a primer with a little um, uh, a little cork cover over it. It was <laughs> it was not great. Um, and I think they recognized that that was a key problem. I think that's yeah. why they started to focus more on the ammunition. Um, but that, that definitely was important in the, uh, uh, in the evolution of the lever action. And I think any serious gun collector today that's really into lever actions, you know, you have to own 
um, one of the original Henry Yellow Boys. That's yep. kind of a that's kind of a really important rifle. And if you really want to be a serious collector, you've also got to go back and get one of those original Volcanics. And then you can argue about you know do you get a Smith and Wesson or a Volcanic repeating arms or a New Haven Arms. There was there was sort of a whole continuum there. But but Smith and Wesson never produced a, a lever gun back then, right? Oh, they did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The original, the original 18454 Smith and Wesson company did produce. They did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, I thought they they had the patent, but they hadn't. Nope. They it. were they were they were producing them. What do you remember? What cartridge it was? What caliber? I th- I want to say it was a 29 or 30. There was two cartridge sizes. There was sort of the small frame and the large frame. Mm-hmm. Ryan, you've got me on this one. I want to say it was oh, a t- 20. Stumped him. Yeah, <laughs> you stumped me. I think the smaller one was. I want to say it was around a 30 caliber. I think the larger one was around a. 40, 42, 44, somewhere in that yeah, A big range. one and a small one. Yeah, big big and small, basically. Interesting. Okay, okay. So um, as as you kind of have studied this, is there a particular area of, of time for Smith & Wesson, or have you kind of covered it just from beginning to, to now pretty evenly? Yeah. Is there a particular interest for you that... So my my personal love is the Model 1s. I th- that, that's really where it began for the company, that was the first metallic cartridge mm-hmm. revolver in the world that we know of. Um, that, that was the focus of my my research when I was writing my thesis. So that that's really always been my first love. But, you know, it's neat to look at Smith & Wesson's evolution over time and to see how technology and loading, technology and reloading, how the manual of arms got refined over time, um, how ex- Smith & Wesson was exploring new ideas. Mm-hmm. So I've I've really come to love the, the entire 100 and... I have to do the on the spot math now. 170 ish years, yeah, of, <laughs> ish um, years of history there, and and to look back over it and say, wow, it's really interesting to see how Smith and Wesson evolved with the times, um, and how there was some really seminal things that the company did that to this day still uh, still persist. You know, the the development of the 38 special cartridge that uh, that that came out in 1899, and we still produce that K frame, what we now call the Model 10 revolver. It's the longest continually produced firearm in the world. They've been making that gun for over 125 years now. If you're into guns, there are those particular categories or particular models that you feel like I need to own one or I at least need to shoot one to kind of understand and appreciate it. But let's go back to the Model 1 because we were kind of having a little conversation before we started. And I think it's interesting when you look at a company, a gun company over almost two centuries now and their first major production gun was essentially a concealed carry gun. Yeah, it absolutely and, was. And people who don't know or don't like guns or whatever, you know, they are like, well, people own guns to hunt and to do this. We're like, no, the very first Smith and Wesson gun describe the model one and, and describe Cause I was saying, you know, all these, these old guns you see uh, as far as handguns, revolvers are little bitty a lot. Yeah. So many of them are little bitty. Yeah. they're tiny. So talk about the model one and kind of how that came about. Yeah. So when we talk about old guns, a lot of people immediately think of lever actions in the wild west and mm-hmm. model threes and Colt single actions. And they're, they're, they're physically big guns. Right. And certainly the percussion revolvers, the, the earlier Colts and Manhattans tended to be very large guns. The model one, what um, was a complete 180 from that. It, it, it's a tiny, tiny little gun. It was chambered in the original 22 black powder rim fire. It was about the same size as a modern 22 short. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, much weaker than a, than a modern round. Um, but it's a tiny little revolver. And here's, here's what was happening at the time. In the 1850s in particular, uh, America was well into the throes of the Industrial Revolution. So we we had factories, and, and not just for guns, I mean, for textiles, for all sorts of things. We had factories popping up all over the place. They tended to be concentrated in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. That was uh, that that was where the best, uh, well, it's where the financiers were. They were in, you know, New York and Boston and Philadelphia. Um, it's where we had the best distribution network. The railroad network was well-established, steamship lines. So it was, it, again, it was that sort of Silicon Valley of the 1850s. The problem we had was we had cities that were absolutely bursting at the seams. We had 
uh, people from the country moving into the cities. We had city populations just naturally growing on their own. We had immigrants coming in, Mm -hmm. moving to the cities because that's where work was. And we didn't really have the concept of a municipal police department in the way that we think of it now. We think now when we think of a big, especially in a big city like New York, it's you know, the police department is kind of a full service agency that does all sorts of things, a lot of preventative policing that really didn't exist in the 1850s, not in the way it did now. So cities became incredibly dangerous places to be. And a lot of the early gun industry was actually focused on that, was focused on small, you know, it was the birth of concealed carry, Mm -hmm. uh, small concealable weapons that you could carry in a, you know, your vest pocket or your jacket pocket. Yeah, exactly. A pocket gun. And that's really what what the Model 1 came into. You know, when I see them advertised online, a lot of times I see, uh, you know, sort of a gambler's gun or a lady of the night gun. But really what it probably was was just, you know, some factory worker in, I don't know, Baltimore or Mm -hmm. or Chicago or uh, Philadelphia that just wanted to go to work and be safe. Yeah. And and that's what they were carrying for protection. It was enormously successful for Smith & Wesson. I mean, they sold over a quarter million of those guns from 1857 to 1883. Wow. Yeah, they made a lot of those little guns. It was wildly popular. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, thinking about, so 1856, they really get off the ground and get going. And then five years later, Civil War hits. Yeah. That's got to be a big deal, especially for a gun company. A big war breaks out. Yeah. What happened then? How did that affect Smith? Yeah, that was, um, you know, the interesting thing with the Civil War is we, as historians, when we look back, there's a there's a sort of tendency to think that this was kind of preordained at the time that, you know, when Smith and Wesson founded in 1856, and there, there certainly was political instability at the time. But the, the, the idea that the Civil War would would start and rage for four years um, was absolutely not a certainty. So I think in terms of the founding of the company, I think I think they were jumping more on the opportunity uh, that the expiration of Colt's patent presented that now right. the revolver market was going I mean, to be wide open. Like you said, the Model 1 wasn't wasn't yeah. a military gun. It no, was a it little bitty revolver. Yeah. But certainly when the war came along, look, <laughs> con- conflict um, helps gun sales. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's just a simple truth. Uh, people were scared. You had a lot of men going to war. So you had um, a lot of households where the that sort of historic head of household wasn't wasn't there anymore. The husband, the kids, uh, you know, the male sons weren't there anymore. And I don't mean to imply that women weren't involved in the war effort because they certainly were. Um, but you had a lot of people who were just scared. They they didn't know what sure. was going to happen. It's instability, right? And that absolutely helped gun sales. And certainly in the 1860s, I think uh, Smith & Wesson's distributor in New York City, I'm, I'm sure basically he just said, look, whatever you can send me, send me. Right. I'll pay cash for it. Right. And that's actually what he did. I mean, he paid cash for everything. Um, and I don't think he had any problem selling it. I mean, I think it was, you know, like in, like in some more recent times, like during the pandemic, I think there was just a sense of like, if, if it's a gun and it's for sale, somebody's going to buy it. So certainly during the war, um, we know that those guns were selling and there was actually, there was some, there was some companies that would produce guns that would violate Smith and Wesson's patent. And when Smith and Wesson sued them and took possession of those guns, they would sell them because there was such a market for it. <laughs> We're going to seize your guns and then sell yeah, them. Pretty much. Any gun yeah. that you could get your hands on. Yeah, that was exactly We've been it. through this in the we, last 10 years we, a couple times. We have been this. Yeah. Been through this. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly during the Civil War, I mean, any gun that they could sell. And the the, the Model 1, the Model 1 and a half and the Model 2, which were all produced during the Civil War... Um, were never officially used in the war effort. They were never what we would call a martial arm. Right. But I think there was a lot of soldiers that were buying those as sort of like a backup or a side, sure. or, you know, a boot gun or something like that. Um, so I, I, I don't mean to imply that they were never carried into battle. I think a lot of them probably were, um, but they were never officially adopted as a military arm, but that certainly okay. didn't slow down sales for, for Smith & Wesson. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's take a quick break. After the break, let's talk about the gun that's sitting on this table right now. Secure is known for gun storage, and I know you think of gun safes when you think gun storage, but they also have gun cabinets. These are built with military-grade materials and styling, and their lineup of cabinets offers true capacity, linear layout, and modularity that you want for fast access and optimal optimization of your guns and gear. Go check it out at securegunstorage.com. Look up gun cabinets, and everyone who looks at them goes, ooh, I think I probably need a few of those. Secure it, gunstorage.com. RangeReadyStudios.com is where you go to find out about the classes that we're offering here. We've got 
pistol classes, rifle classes. We have special experience classes. We just offered the Savage Concealed Carry Experience using a brand new Savage gun that the students are going to be able to use and take home with them. So pretty cool. Go over to rangeradystudios.com to sign up for our email alerts and find out about new classes. Ballistic Advantage just launched a new line of pistol barrels for the SIG P365. And they didn't start out small. They've got like dozens and dozens of different sizes and colors and configurations for the SIG P365 family of guns. And, you know, this is a custom, very well-made barrel. Could improve your accuracy, could improve the looks, could give you a threaded barrel that gives you a little bit more length and weight out there. And also if you want to run it suppressed or put a comp on it. So just go over to BallisticAdvantage.com to learn more. Ruger. They keep coming out with new stuff. Right now, we've been shooting their carbines. We've been shooting their pistols. We've been shooting their rifles. Probably the biggest news from Ruger lately is the new Ruger American Rifle Part 2, Gen 2, if you will. And it has some updated stylings and also some other features that people really like. The thing that we were impressed with, frankly, was how accurate it is. I mean, it's just shooting these little cloverleaf groups at 100 yards. So pretty impressive performance from a gun that really isn't that expensive. Go over to Ruger.com to learn more about the new Ruger Generation 2 American Rifle. TSOS USA is starting to make waves. I hear people talking about it. We've been playing around and shooting with them for a couple of years now. Um, one of the guns that they have a whole line of is the PX series, the PX9 Gen 3 series. And it's a kind of traditional polymer striker fired gun one of the biggest deals to me is the trigger is great and a good trigger in a small gun can help you be a better shooter to learn more go over to tsasusa.com that's t-i-s-a-s-u-s-a.com so mike you brought us a few different guns and if you're listening to this go over we're actually going to be putting out some videos with mike about some of the really cool Really old guns. We're talking about the Model 1. You've got serial number 5, like the fifth serial one. Number five. So pretty amazing. Um, so we're going to do some videos about that, you know, Gun Talk YouTube and Facebook and all our other channels. But we kind of picked this one out because we thought people would enjoy hearing about it. And obviously, if you're watching this, you can see a little bit. What do we have here? Okay, this is a 1936 vintage Smith & Wesson 357 registered magnum registered magnum so explain the registered magnum part sure. of this so when smith and wesson so smith and wesson introduced the 357 magnum cartridge to the world they were the company that invented that and of course the gun that went with it mm -hmm. and it, it was actually in company literature it was just called the 357 so when you said 357 magnum people understood that there's one gun it. chambered yeah. in that yeah there is there is a gun <laughs> called the 357 magnum but we, we call this the, the registered Magnum because what would happen was, well, first of all, it was a bespoke gun. It was entirely bespoke. So there wasn't just a, a, a sort of catalog model that you would buy. There was a long order form that you this would This is off out. menu. This is, <laughs> this is all off menu. Yeah. And you would pick the barrel length. So you could get any barrel length. I, I'm going on memory here. I'm going to say, I think it was three and a half inches to eight and, eight and three eighths inches. I think, I think that was the range. Um, but you could pick any barrel length um, in quarter inch increments. Wow. Uh, you would pick the front sight and the rear sight that you wanted. You would even tell them how you wanted it sighted. You know, I want it sighted with uh, 38 special ammunition at 25 yards, or I want it sighted with 357 Magnum ammunition at 50 yards. However you wanted wow. it sighted, they would do that. Uh, the style of grips, the finish, everything was bespoke on this gun. So you would, you would special order this gun and Smith & Wesson would make it to your specification. And when they shipped it to you, you would also get a registration card with it and you would fill out your information. And I, I should qualify that most of these guns were actually shipped to distributors. Okay. Okay. So it would go, it would go to your local distributor, your local retailer, you would pick it up and it came with a registration card. And if you wanted, you could fill out that registration card. You would mail it back to Smith & Wesson. You had registered the gun mm -hmm. and they would send you a registration certificate. It was a, it was a fully calligraphed certificate with your name on it that you had wow. bought this gun with this registration number in it. It sort of registered it to you. It didn't, I mean, I don't want to, it, it didn't really change anything or do anything. Um, 
but people thought it was cool. Yeah. And and this was a way to sort of make this kind of a kind of a boutique or a halo gun for the company. Um, so the original registered magnums, it was it was the first six thousand and and something, um, were what we call registered magnums. Well, the problem for Smith and Wesson was it just became too costly to run this whole boutique gun yeah, program. It's not efficient. Bespoke is not efficient. It is definitely not efficient. And the thing was the gun was actually catching on. There was police agencies that were saying, Hey, we want those. Right. Um, they, they were a very popular gun. So Smith and Wesson stopped the registration part mm-hmm. and they came up with some, you know, catalog variations. Okay, here's you, you know, yeah, here are the barrel links we're gonna make, yeah. right? Here's the That's sites ex- configuration we're gonna do. That's exactly it. So they, it's a good way to research, though. Like, oh, let's yeah. put it out there. Let's people pick what they want. And I mean, I don't know if they got this this sophisticated in their planning, but like, well, half of the guns people wanted a six inch or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah it was it, it was probably very easy for them to figure out what people wanted. So Smith and Wesson dropped the registered part. So then it was just the three fifty seven Magnum, and it, interestingly, the non registered Magnums are are even rarer than the registered Magnums because then. Um, Smith and Wesson stopped making them and everything else entirely for World War II. Oh, okay. So during World War II, the only so gun... So yeah, they had a, what, about a five-year run on these? Yeah. Four they, or five years? Oh, I don't even know if it was five years. They started in 35. They went to, I want to say like 38 or 30. Okay. Maybe 40, somewhere in that range. So... And then they then they switched saying, we need to change for the war effort? Yeah. So all of all of Smith and Wesson's production, every, everything from 22 up to 44 just ceased... And wow. the only gun that they were producing was the the K frame, what we now call the Model Ten. Um, then it was called the the Victory Revolver, um, which was the thirty eight military and police, and that was military the only police. gun that they produced during World War II. So that's the only gun. It's the only gun they produced during World War II. Yeah. Well, that was such a that was. I mean, we know. I mean, people know that story of like the entire country flipping a switch to say everything is for the war effort. Yeah. We're not making a variety of things here. Like we're going to make. I mean, was it called the Model Ten at that point? No, the Model Ten, the 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 model number designation came in the late fifties. Okay, okay. Technically, it was the thirty eight military and police. Um, during World War II, they started using a, a, they called them Victory revolvers. They had a V serial number prefix. So if you've got a, if you've got what looks like a Model Ten with a V serial number prefix and then up to a six digit serial number, that's a, that's a Victory revolver. But that was made during World War II. You could wow. have them in. It was like Henry Ford in the Model T. You could have it in one color mm-hmm. or any color you wanted, as long as it was black. Right, right. Um, it was a uh, uh, it was a very durable black finish that they put on them. But that's all they produced during World War II. So at that point, the three fifty seven just stopped, um, and it was after the war that they restarted production of the three fifty seven Magnum. And then in the late nineteen fifties, of course, that became the Model twenty seven when they when they shifted from model names to model numbers. Right, that became the Model twenty seven, which we still know and love today. You know, it's funny. And people who know and love Smith and Wesson get familiar with all these model numbers. And me as a media marketing guy, I'll, I'll tease gun companies about naming their guns, the, the one, two, three, four, five gun. And I'm like, you know, no, you need to do like car companies. You name it like the, the judge, the Camaro, the whatever. Right. And some have done that now, you know, Smith Wesson has the response. I think we're shooting that out on the range today. Um, which is more of a mark, letting the marketing people name your product versus the engineers perhaps, (laughs) but that's just my pet peeve. (laughs) So, so Smith and Wesson actually did that for years and you had, um, you know, the 3844 heavy duty versus Mm -hmm. the outdoorsman. And I, I, I think the problem was that some of the terminology got so complicated and they had these strange names. I, I, my guess is that at some point somebody probably just said, you know what, let's just go with arbitrary model numbers. Right. Because, you know. And the six designates than, as a stainless gun. Yeah. Yeah. Six, ten, six, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So the, the, the guns that um, the model number 10, 11, 12, those tended to be the K frames. Uh, the 20s tended to be uh, N frames. The, the sixes were the stainless steel. So there was, there was some method to the madness there, but even that kind of broke down over time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think something that we were talking about, um, so you are, um, you, you run the Smith and Wesson, uh, historical yeah. society. I'm, I'm going to say that wrong. Yeah. There's, there's uh, three or four of us that, um, that sort of run the historical foundation. I'm the secretary okay. treasurer of that. Okay. Um, we have uh, a chairman and a board, 
I'm the secretary treasurer. Um, I also do some of the historical research. And then we have Don Mundell, who's writing uh, all the factory letters now. Okay. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Because yeah. if people are listening to this, the, the neat thing about guns is if you take care of them, they last a lifetime. They last several lifetimes. And so it's very possible that someone's listening to this saying, I've got an old Smith and Wesson that I just, I got from my dad, my grandfather, whatever. Sure. How do I find out more information about it? Is that something you guys can provide? Absolutely. So the Smith and Wesson Historical Foundation actually manages all of Smith and Wesson's corporate archives. Uh, We manage everything up to 1967. That's kind of when our uh, stuff cuts off. It's not a coincidence that that's right around when the Gun Control Act of 68 was passed. So Smith & Wesson has retained uh, all of their corporate archives from 68 onwards, although we have access to that and we can certainly research it. Um, But I think the key service that we provide that you were talking about was the factory letter service, Mm -hmm. something that Smith & Wesson's done for many, many decades now. I think it goes back to the late 60s, early 70s. And really what it is is a letter that talks about that particular model of gun. So it'll give kind of a historical overview of say the registered Magnum and, you know, it was developed in 1935 and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. Uh, but then we'll also provide details about that specific gun. And that, that usually what we can provide is when the gun shipped from the factory, where it shipped to and the factory configuration, you know, it was a six and a half inch barrel, blue finish, Magnus stocks or whatever. Mm-hmm. However, the gun was configured when it was left the factory. And for a lot of people that just enhances their enjoyment of it. If you are a serious collector, you're collecting for investment. That's a way that you can sort of document that this, this gun is in its factory original configuration that somebody didn't refinish it or something like that. Um, and that, that's something that people really enjoy. We, we write a couple thousand letters every year and so it's a, it's a <laughs> lot of fun to be able to go into the archives and just read stuff, and Yeah, see cool things. So there's got to be some that come to mind when someone says, hey, can you know, here's the information on my gun. Here's yeah. the serial number. Or here's the, the model that you look into it. And there's some interesting things you discover. Are there some of those that come to mind? Yeah, there's there's one in particular. We had um, it was a member of the Smith & Wesson Collectors Association some years ago, uh, bought a 2232 heavy duty revolver uh, from a pawn shop. And, he paid, you know, I don't know, let's say $300 for it. I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it wasn't much. And it was just a cool revolver. And he decided he was going to uh, get a factory letter for it. So he sent in the information. We do the research on it. And the letter came back uh, that this particular revolver had shipped to a man named Frank Butler. That name doesn't mean much to most people. Um, but if you do a little bit of digging, you'll find out that Frank Butler's wife was Annie Oakley. Whoa. Yeah. And that's one of those all of a sudden where, whoa, this is this is really important. Wait a minute. <laughs> and I, I know when that gun went to auction, it sold for um there there was a few more zeros behind the uh no behind the price that it sold for. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly with something like that, provenance is everything. And when you have a gun that you can document as having gone to Frank Butler and Annie Oakley, um, that puts it on the map. Yeah. At that point. So you know, sometimes we sometimes we do find guns like that. Um, we get a lot of requests from people where they say, you know, I think this was owned by Buffalo Bill, or I think it was owned by <laughs> Elvis. And unfortunately, we you know that might be true, but we can't we can't document that with the factory records. Uh, but once in a while, we do we do strike gold. Or yeah. somebody strikes gold. There's probably a lot of those guns that are seen around that it's like Absolutely. a family legend. Yep. And then you, it's maybe it ends up being true. There's probably a lot of family legends that it's like, yep. no, just because you live in the Memphis area doesn't mean this gun was owned by Elvis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other, and you know, the other tricky part is, and this is something I have to explain to people a lot is Smith and Wesson's paperwork would, will genuinely, generally only show where the gun went immediately when it left the factory. Right. Now, you and I both know working in the industry that most guns, and and this was true 150 years ago too, and it's certainly true today, go to large wholesalers or distributors. They go to right. a, you know, Davidson's or Lipsy's or whatever. Where the gun goes from there is not going to be in Smith & Wesson's paperwork. So we can only show that first stop where it went. Now, certainly if you're dealing with a shooter like Elmer Keith or Annie Oakley, somebody that the factory has a very close relationship with, then Oftentimes the paperwork will show that the gun was shipped directly to Elmer Keith. Right. Um, but unfortunately with a lot of these guns, they just went to a wholesaler or a distributor. And it may be the case that 
Elvis wanted to go buy that gun at three in the morning and somebody <laughs> opened up the gun store. But unfortunately, there's maybe probably... it was maybe it was owned by Elvis. Yeah, maybe it was owned by Elvis. <laughs> so I always tell people, I'm like, look, I'm not saying that the story is true or false. I just can't corroborate it with the factory yeah. paperwork. So, yeah, the reality is a lot of the gun companies that do sell to distributors, once they sell that gun to a distributor, it's sold. Yeah, it's, they sold the gun. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. It doesn't, after its, its journey to a, to a dealer and then to in the hands of yeah. Mike or Ryan, it's like, yeah. whatever. It's in the wind at that point. All right. So uh, historical guns, collecting, you know, you talked about, you know, walking into a pawn shop and went, that's a neat little revolver. There are perhaps deals to be had or maybe just guns that would just be fun to shoot. Is there an area that you would tell people, Oh, this is a neat area to look in, or I don't know if it's a value thing or if it's just, there's still really good guns and they were made in the fifties and you can pick them up because people don't appreciate it or something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time cruising the, the, the pawn shops and the gun stores, uh, specifically looking for stuff from the fifties and sixties. Um, it's a, it's a fun era to document from. We can usually actually pull the factory invoice and mm. sometimes the factory invoice will actually have information on it about who the gun was intended for. I had, uh, I had one pawn shop find last summer. It was an early 1950s, uh, what we call in the collecting world, a pre-model 10. Uh, so this was the 38 military and police okay. uh, because it was a post-war gun. We sort of call it a pre-model it was, it, yeah, it wasn't quite, it had been named that it yet. We hadn't quite gotten to that renaming yet, wow. but collectors call it a pre-model 10. Uh, it was a factory snub nose. Uh, oh, it was neat. a two-inch barrel, so two-inch square butt K-frame pistol. And I, it just looked really cool. And I, I, I took a chance on it and I pulled the factory invoice for it. And it turned out that it had shipped to a hardware store in Alexandria, Louisiana, just mm -hmm. up the road from mm -hmm. us here. And it actually noted on the invoice that it was for... Inspector Daniels of the Alexandria Police Department. So somebody had just put that notation on it so that when the gun came in, they would remember right. you know, what they had special ordered it for. So in that case, even though it only even though the factory documentation technically only shows where it goes, that actually told me exactly who wore that gun. And it, it actually came with a, a, a homemade leather holster. It was a really cool holster, but it was just, you know, it was a great package. And I actually ended up reaching out to the family and talking to them. And they no were kidding. really thrilled that this gun had uh, had sort of come to surface and that somebody had taken an interest in it. And, uh, wow. you know, I, I, I didn't do a restoration. I just cleaned it up and oiled it. And it actually came out beautiful. And it's got that kind of, I don't know, police glow that mm -hmm. duty guns that get carried for like, 20 or 30 years have it's, 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 I call it honest wear and those deals are out there. You know, yeah. I see them in pawn shops a lot and, uh, they're, they're easy guns to find. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to learn how to sort of identify a fifties or sixties Smith and Wesson from a much later one. Uh, a lot of pawn shops don't know that or don't know how to do that, right. um, but it's pretty easy stuff to learn how to do. And I've, I've gotten good now. I can sort of sweep my eye across a cabinet and I can see the one where it's like, Ooh, I'm going to take a look at that. Yeah. One. <laughs> um, in terms of being worth a lot, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it changes the value of the gun that much, but it's just a lot of fun when there's a local connection. And especially if you get really lucky and you can tie it to an individual. Sure. There's just, a story there. You think about even to just think about inspector Daniels yeah. carrying that gun in his line of work for years and years. Yeah. And did he have to, did he have to use it? Did it, did he have to draw it at all? Did it, you know, was it, but it was an important piece of kit for him. Absolutely. For, for years and years and trusted. Right. Yeah. Um, Mike, thanks for being with us. Oh, my this pleasure. Has been fun. It's been fun. So, um, how do people find out? Do you guys have a website we or do. something like that? Yeah. Uh, SW historical foundation, or if you just Google Smith and Wesson historical foundation, you'll okay. find us. Uh, if you've got a question, there's a contact us page, reach out, be patient because we get a lot of emails. Yeah. I do my best to respond to them as quickly as I can, but um, we're happy to answer questions. Uh, the standard catalog of Smith & Wesson is uh, is a fantastic reference book. I recommend that to everybody, but yeah, reach out. Awesome. And, uh, let us know what you got. All right. Awesome. Mike Helms, thanks for being with us. That's it for us, guys. We will see you next time on Gun Talk Nation. To see all of Gun Talk's content, go to guntalk.com, guntalktv.com, or sign up for the Gun Talk newsletter.